Dr. Ayman, the mic, you can introduce uh, all the speakers and then you can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Uh, and uh, thank you. Yani, also, we thank uh, Al Qasimi uh, Hospital. And uh, uh, I uh, welcome all our esteemed speakers and uh, welcome to our first instructor instructional uh, uh, surgical retina course. Uh, uh, we have with us Dr. Mustafa Hanout, Dr. Ahmed Habib, Dr. Abdullah Abban, Dr. Muhammad Tawfiq, and Dr. Ahmed Salam. I want to uh, welcome all our dear colleagues. Thank and uh, I think we should start. Uh, we are already a little bit late. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Dr. Mustafa Hanout. Dr. Mustafa uh, will start with the first uh, talk. And it will be about uh, uh, pars plana vitrectomy 101. Please, Dr. Mustafa, uh, uh, the panel is yours. Uh, Dr. Ayman, I think Dr. Mustafa is not available. If you can go for okay, the next Okay, we can talk. go to Dr. Dr. Habib. We can start with, we yeah, can can. Start with Dr. Habib if he's ready. Yes, I'm ready. Yeah, so we Dr. can Dr. Habib. Dr. Good, Habib. Good evening, Dr. Habib. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. So sir. I'm going to start. You, 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 you start. We start with your with your is it on? which is, which is parsana vitrectomy for the primary retinal detachment. Please. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the the uh, first language before for before. The I'm sorry. Uh, just sorry to for, for the uh, interruption, and I want to skip my my my. Uh, I had few slides. I want just to skip them, just to keep uh, to keep uh, on the time. You can go for them. Okay. Okay. If, uh, so. So I'm going to talk about the uh, basic techniques for uh, primary uh, parts plan vitrectomy, simple parts plan vitrectomy for primary uh, RD. Uh, in this uh, talk, I will talk uh, about the uh, basic steps for uh, RD repair, uh, the shortest and simplest ways for best outcome, tricks to make your surgery easier, and uh, I'm going to touch on uh, some controversies. First, the trocar and infusion canal insertion. If, uh, uh, first of all, if there is a hypotony due to uh, uh, RD and stuff like that, you can uh, just uh, inject some saline to make the uh, globe firm so as the, for the trucers to enter uh, easily. And then you enter the infusion and always check for the infusion entry. You, nev you can never skip uh, this step. Uh, then uh, enter uh, as oblique as you can uh, with the trucers uh, so as to avoid leak. I like to uh, put them as uh, closest to, but not at uh, three uh, and nine o'clock positions to be able to work uh, on the superior uh, parts of the uh, retina. Um, uh, I like to do the anterior vitrectomy. Uh, and I like to do it with the, the microscope uh, only, not by the biome or the recite, uh, for better depth perception in relation to lens. And I use the oblique inclination to visualize the uh, vitreous. Uh, here you can see the difference between the oblique illu uh, illumination and the uh, coaxial illumination. Here with the oblique illumination, you can see the vitreous swell uh, so as to uh, remove it. Uh, then comes the uh, most important uh, part is the uh, posterior vitreous uh, detachment. First, you adjust the position of the side lens or the biome lens the, with the, uh, uh, then uh, go to the highest magnification of disc on the disc and focus and return to the suitable zoom. Remember the uh, uh, circle of light of the pupil uh, should be filling the uh, lens. Then you uh, uh, stand uh, uh, beside the disc or at it and apply uh, vacuum to the max, stay for uh, uh, some time and then uh, move slowly tangential to the retina. You stand over the disc for some time to catch a good chunk of the vitreous, then uh, uh, pass tangential, not uh, vertical, and then you can lift. 
After that, you can uh, remove some of the vitreous to uh, go to the deeper levels of the uh, vitreous, and there you have it, the uh, posterior vitreous detachment. Um, uh, uh, put the cutter away, the, the cutter opening away from the macula, and uh, uh, then apply cutting to avoid uh, injury to the neck. Uh, this is another video for the, for the, the same uh, technique. You stand over the uh, disc, apply the vacuum away from the uh, fovea, and then uh, pass uh, slowly tangential over the retina and then lift. Uh, then the vitreous removal and shaving, uh, you uh, remove after PVD is complete, the vitreous removal uh, uh, is done as far as you can. And uh, you cannot pause the PVD uh, at the vitreous base because it's anatomically, anatomically impossible to uh, do PVD at the vitreous uh, base, hence the shaving, uh, which is uh, removing as uh, uh, the vitreous as close as you can to the retina. Um, actually, this is a controversial uh, step. Some uh, 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 reports have um, uh, denied its importance, but the most important part is to shave uh, around the uh, uh, break. And remember that uh, the RD treatment is the treatment of the break. Um, and uh, do uh, indentation uh, all around. If, you, if you're not going to do uh, shaving, uh, you must at least uh, indent all around uh, 360 uh, because it's a, uh, and it's called internal search and, it's a, and it is a must in all cases to check for any uh, breaks that you can uh, that you have missed. Then the fluid area exchange. Uh, first, you aspirate some fluid from the break, then uh, turn on air and stay uh, perfectly still and don't go to the uh, uh, edges of the uh, of the break so as uh, to catch it uh, to catch it as i did here um, then until the edges are dry um, you can uh, mark the uh, uh, edges uh, with uh, uh, diathermy if you're not uh, you're not uh, uh, sure that you're going to see it. then turn the patient head uh, towards the break to make it more dependent, it always helps. Here I'm asking the patient to lift his chin up towards the break and for a few seconds, wait for a few seconds, the fluid will shift and you can complete the uh, 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 fluid uh, aspiration from under the retina. Then do the, uh, the laser barrage. The most important is laser around the break. You can do all, uh, also cryo, they do it in some places, but we do uh, laser, uh, moderate burns, a little bit less than these burns. Uh, you can you can use 360 uh, uh, laser barrage if the um, if there are uh, multiple breaks uh, or eccentric degenerations at the periphery of the retina. But uh, this point is controversial and uh, and it's actually not necessary. Uh, the tamponade, uh, Doctor. Uh, uh, Abdullah will uh, will talk about the technique of uh, injection of the, the uh, tamponade, especially gas. Uh, but the choice of tamponade, in my opinion, depends on retinal factors and logistical factors, uh, such as retinal factors such as the presence uh, uh, or the number of breaks, complexity of RD, the period of time since uh, its occurrence, uh, and logistical factors uh, according to, to the patient. If the patient is not available for uh, follow-up or the uh, far place of residence or availability for uh, re-operation, should recurrence occur uh, or plan of flight, if uh, he cannot uh, put gas, uh, use gas tamponade if he's going on a plane in the uh, uh, next one uh, uh, or two weeks or single eye patients so cannot bear to be uh, not seeing for uh, some time. So these are uh, factors that we should uh, consider that uh, actually silicon does not prevent recurrence it just slows it down um, uh, its progression uh, uh, so as to find the convenient time for re-intervention so in summary uh, insert trokers as oblique as you can always check for the infusion before turning it on in pvd stay over disc edge vacuum for some time move slowly tangential then lift shaving uh, around the break is the most important the rest is controversial and that internal search is a must uh, fluid exchange, uh, the fluid uh, aspiration first, then stay perfectly still 
uh, until air fills the eye, then uh, head positioning might help. Uh, laser barrage around the break, the rest is unnecessary and tamponade choice depends on multiple factors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for this uh, uh, nice and brief presentation. Uh, let me let me just start by um, asking you uh, yes. how to, how to avoid uh, retinal incarceration and prolapse of the vitreous in cases when you are repairing RD. Uh, this is my first question. Number two is how to avoid accumulation of the fluid in the posterior pool while you are doing an air fluid exchange in your uh, RD cases? Okay, first of all, the, uh, the uh, vitreous or retinal incarceration, we have, we have not been uh, seeing it uh, a lot lately because of the smaller gauge and use of trokers. We used to uh, see it more often during uh, the era of the 20 gauge, uh, but uh, it usually uh, happens uh, if you're not uh, removing uh, a good amount of vitreous at the uh, troker side, at the troker sides or entry of the uh, instruments, and if the retina is high, if the retina is too high, you can uh, aspirate some fluid so as the retina to be uh, uh, pushed back a little bit so as you can um, uh, work freely. Uh, the other question about the posterior pole fluid actually cannot prevent. 100% uh, removal of the um, uh, of the fluid in the posterior pole. You just uh, decrease it as much uh, as much as you can, and I, uh, I use the head positioning to do this. Uh, however, if you can leave some fluid that are not so uh, uh, so much that it could uh, uh, cause uh, faults, uh, it's okay. Uh, and uh, uh, some people use uh, PFC. I don't like it uh, very much, but sometimes I use it. Thank you, Dr. Habib. This is what I wanted uh, our uh, junior colleague to hear from you. Uh, another question is, how would you protect the lens uh, in cases of uh, fake detachments? What are the uh, 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 steps that you are going to avoid or will do to protect your lens so as not to cause okay. cataract afterwards? Uh, uh, so I like to uh, enter the uh, with uh, scleotomies at uh, four point uh, uh, at four sometimes four point five but four is enough. Um, that is enough. If uh, yeah, um, uh, a nice trick is to uh, always keep the eye coaxial. If uh, if you're uh, rotating the 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 eye a little. Uh, much or a little bit even, uh, you can injure the uh, the lens with the uh, probes. So if it is coaxial, I've seen I've seen with indentation. The, the uh, some consultants do uh, with indentation uh, shaving on the other side, and it's not and it's not, it's not causing any problems. Uh, another uh, thing that is classic teaching that you don't cross uh, the uh, uh, instruments. However, some of us do. So yes, so uh, uh, handling handling the instruments from right to left is also very important. Not to cross uh, uh, beneath the lens. I think uh, yes, I totally agree. This is a very important step. Uh, I want our uh, uh, other uh, esteemed speakers, if they want, just to share us with the with the discussion. Please do. Any other question for Dr. Habib? Yeah, okay. thank you very much, Dr. Habib. It's really useful, and I exactly do the same. Just uh, to add a little bit on the point of avoiding fluid. Again, you can't be sure that 100% of the fluid is removed. Two things yes, I even use, with BFC. Yeah, I, I rarely use BFCL for primary detachment. But what I normally do, I do exactly like what you did, and I just try to avoid going to the disc at any time, because actually this residual fluid over the macula is just tamponading it. And what I do after exchanging for gas, I ask most of the patient to sleep on the back for an hour or two. This usually helps the RBE bump to drain most of the uh, subretinal fluid. And from the other side, usually the break is peripheral, I mean, uh, anterior the equator and the gas will be on, in contact with the brake at that time. So this will help the ages of the brake in a way or another 
to stick. So this means that the retina mostly will be stable in this position as much as we can. And if any even microfold happens, hopefully we'll be away from the macula. Actually, actually, the, the the key point here is gas. If you're using silicon, if you're if you're using gas, you just don't don't uh, uh, do aspiration over this even um, uh, to aid for the uh, high integrity retina reattachment. However, if you're putting silicon, you have to drain over the disc. I think this is a very important point: is the use of the tamponade. We are going to concentrate on this in the following uh, definitely talks. Thank you, Dr. Habib, for, for uh, this nice presentation. And let me uh, uh, move to Dr. Abdullah Dan. Dr. Abdullah will be talking about uh, partana vitrectomy for macular disorders. Please, Dr. Abdullah. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ayman for, and Dr. Mohammed for the kind invitation. It's my pleasure to be here. And uh, can you allow me to share the uh, presentation? Uh, Ahmed, I think you are share. Uh, can you log off? Yeah, yeah no, sir. Uh, I'm trying to share, just giving me. Okay, I think it's allowing me I'm now. Sharing mine. Okay. Yeah. Can you see my presentation now? Can yes, you see we my... do. Yes, oh. yes, we do, Dr. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll, con I'll continue what Dr. Habib had just started, and today we'll discuss basic macular surgery course. And I'll try to be as simple as much as I can and try to give just a few quick messages for the uh, new retinal surgeons. So uh, when we talk about macular surgery, it's mainly those macular conditions like macular hole, epiretinal membrane, vitro macular tractions and some other less common disorders. And for most of these surgery, the technique is more or less standard. It's just a vitrectomy followed by a peel step. And then we may need to do some additional steps. I'll share you, with you what I usually do. And please feel free to ask any questions if you have. So I normally use smaller gauges peripherals for this surgery because these are less complex surgery preferably 25 or 20 gauge, 27. Also, I strongly recommend taking extra time when putting the trockers. And as you can see here, I beveled all the trockers, especially when you, if you blank gas to avoid any leak. My preferred anesthesia is subtenone, but any local anesthesia would work. And I prefer to do combined cataracts for most of these cases, especially if they are over 30, uh, 55. Because if you plan gas or any other furnace, this is mostly will induce cataract. When I do cataract, it's, I like to finish the AC first and then go to the back of the eye. So I remove all the viscoelastic and then the, put the viscoat and try to avoid any hydration because any one hydration may compromise the visibility of the macula during the beam process. And then we have we have done the oh sorry, we have done the vitrectomy as usual. Then we go to the bill process. Normally we would use the dye. What I like to do is just I like to trickle the dye over the macula when possible. Just try not to force it or push it. Uh, I think yeah. So I try to trickle it as much as I can because sometimes this force in putting the dye itself can be iatrogenic to the macula. When applying the dye, ideally the minimum time or as short as possible. Although if you put the dye for a longer time, you may get a better staining, but we need to keep in mind that most of these dyes have some sort of toxicity. Definitely toxicity is less with blue dyes compared to ICG, but again, the minimum possible, especially in macular surgery, our main consideration is the visual outcome or visual expectation. Next, we move to the bead process, like in cases with macular hole. When possible, I try to do the initial bench, which is actually the most important step. You can do that with a forceps. Some people do with a tail scraper, or some people do a scratch with a 25 or a 27 gauge needle. 
I like the bench with the forceps. And one useful tip here is to look at the shadow of the forceps. And keep in mind the retinal thickness is about 0.4 mil, like 400 micron or 300 micron at this area. So just start the bench just before the shadows meet the, meets the forceps. And you can do a couple of two benches till you exactly get the eye length. And try to be as traumatic, as traumatic as possible. And when possible, I regret from the edges. There are two ways. One is to start like a macular axis from the beginning. I often prefer to take this edge of the flap directly to the macular hole. Because it has been shown the most important thing is complete removal of the ILM around the hole. And then for the further step, always to regret from the flaps trying to avoid any pinch over the papillomacular bundle. You, at this stage, you can increase the size of the veil as much as you can, but in most cases, this is usually not necessary. And here we achieve like about three, 3.5 millimeter veil, which is very reasonable for macular hole surgery. And there were few reports comparing small versus large bead, like three mil versus five mil. And they showed that the outcome is very similar, but functional improvement works well with, is more with smaller bead. Sometimes as a surgeon, or especially uh, with retinal surgeon, they have some to make a big bead, which is usually not necessary in macular hole surgery. And keeping in mind also any bill, the ILM is a part of the retina, is not an auxiliary membrane. And now we are more aware of after multimodal imaging with the possible development of what we call dissociation of optic nerve fiber layer, which has been linked to some decrease in retinal sensitivity after the surgery. In a large study in the UK, they looked at factors which may affect the outcome of the whole surgery. And the most common cause for failure is incomplete ILM bill. So when we do bill, think of clearing the ILM all around the hole. This is possibly the most essential uh, uh, factor. For example, I have done these three cases with relatively like three to four millimeter bill and they all worked really well. In macular surgery, when we next step is to go to trim the vit vitreous, usually it's not necessary to do a very meticulous trimming in, for these cases as the main pathology here is the macula. So usually there's no pr problem in the periphery. So you just do very gentle trimming of the periphery, but no need for meticulous trimming because if you try to do sometimes you may induce retinal breaks, which makes things a little bit more complex with the surgery. But definitely peripheral indentation is meticulous like what Dr. Habib said for any retinal surgery. Moving to the gas, like if you do macular hole, most likely you'll put gas or if you do aberretinal membrane surgery and you had the tear, you may consider gas. And like what Dr. Habib said, even for retinal detachment, you may consider gas. And these are the three most commonly used gas. And you can choose between them according to the complexity of the case. For retinal detachment, I often use SF6 20%. For a macular hole, I use C2 F6, which lasts about four to over five weeks. For more complex cases, I may consider longer acting gas if needed. So what I do, uh, let me just play this video from the start because this is the simplest way of making the gas mix is to use these small canisters or if you have a gas cylinder, essentially the same. And I like to dilute it with a 50 ml syringe and what I normally do, I take some gas, like let's say we're aiming for a 20% SF6. So I fill enough amount of gas and then decrease it to 10%, then take it back to 50 ml. By this way, we have achieved a 20% concentration of 
uh, gas. This is the simplest way and possibly the most accurate. If you try to dilute it on a smaller syringe or try to do give non-expansile volume, it sometimes is not as accurate as this way. And the advantage of using a 50 ml syringe is that you will flush the air inside the eye during the exchange like at least eight to 10 times. So this will make sure that the eye is filled completely with gas. When I inject the gas inside the eye, I like to remove the two superior trockers and do a little bit of massage to make sure they are not leaking. And then the gas is coming here from the infusion and then venting with a 27 or a 30 gauge needle. And this gives you a very good control of the exchange process. And in most cases, a good, very good eye pressure control during the, uh, this process. For macular hole, the main idea of B doing as minimum as possible is to achieve a good visual outcome. And as you know, this is a case where large, medium-sized macular hole, you can see, we look often at the restoration of the outer retina, which is the main determinant of the uh, visual outcome. Another case after the surgery. Then we move to a retinal membrane surgery, essentially the same, the same principle applies when we try to do the deal. initial bench, very gentle as possible. With every retinal membrane, when possible, I try to remove it in block, but sometimes it's not possible in every case. I tend to remove the uh, every retinal membrane only, but after removal, if I look at the retina and I'm not very happy with the profile, I may reapply the dye, like in this case, again, trickles the dye, no need to force it. And then you can see here some residuals of the uh, membrane and ILM. And if you see the ILM wrinkle and easy to remove, go ahead and remove it. But if it's adherent and sticky, like in advanced cases of epiretinal membrane, you may not to need to do so. And really important uh, concept in any macular surgery, remember always less is more. Sometimes excessive maneuvers can cause retinal damage or uh, which may affect the final visual outcome. Again, an example of a case of a retinal membrane. And yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Abandon, for this beautiful presentation about macular Thanks. surgery. Uh, Thanks. Let me let me just uh, uh, say a few comments for our junior colleagues. Colleagues. For macular surgery, we have to make sure that we are peeling all the posterior vitreous. And to do this, the primus alone is a very important uh, uh, tool, especially for the beginners, even for, for the seniors. I still use the primus alone to make sure that I am removing all uh, uh, the vitreous from the posterior pool. This is one. Number two, just to reiterate and just the importance of the peel, uh, you don't need to do an extensive peeling. In fact, if you do, as Dr. Aban said, just a four millimeter, three to four millimeter peel is enough. And this is good for the rare cases of non-closure of your hole. You go, you, you extend your peel, you fill it up with gas. It happened with me twice in the last few years and the hole will close again. So just don't do an extensive peel from the start. The other thing regarding the epithelial membrane, in fact, I don't peel the ILM in the epithelial membrane if I'm sure that I'm removing because most of the time you are removing a large part of your uh, ILM by peeling the epithelial membrane. Uh, let me say uh, uh, one thing about the dye, the dyes. Uh, what, what type of dye are you using, Dr. For your uh, macular no. surgery? Uh, I normally use the dual blue. Uh, because I use it for just for the whole case, if it's an maybe written a membrane or ILM. And uh, with our experience, this dye is of very good quality and is least toxic in uh, our it's experience. Toxic. But yeah, but any dye will blue, do brilliant, the job. brilliant blue. Yes, these are a very yeah. good dyes and they are less toxic uh, uh, to the to the retina itself. 
one one trick, small trick for our junior colleagues. When you are using the dye, if you add uh, some uh, five percent uh, uh, sodium chloride saline to the to the to the dye, this makes it heavier and will definitely settle it's down cold. In, a, in a better way. So I I always add uh, some uh, five percent saline to my dye just to settle it down more on the procedure pool. Uh, thank you very much. And any other question for uh, uh, Dr. Laban from our esteemed colleagues? Yes, I, would, I would like to ahead, ask uh, some questions. Uh, so about this, uh, the, the, the dye uh, trick, I sometimes uh, use it with 10% uh, um, uh, dextrose. Uh, it's uh, a little bit heavier and, uh, and it does it and does the trick. Um, uh, also, sometimes um, I use the the uh, the dropper if uh, uh, it's 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 available. Uh, you just uh, um, uh, sit uh, some of the uh, dye and you drop it as uh, uh, easy as uh, as you can on the uh, retina. And but if you're injecting with your hand, uh, try to decrease the um, the pressure inside the uh, the eye. So as uh, when pushing on the syringe, it will not uh, uh, push suddenly into the uh, retina. Um, another thing I would uh, uh, I would like to point out about the uh, gas um, uh, as the, the, the gas mixing, as you so beautifully uh, uh, illustrated. Uh, mm -hmm. One point, and it happened with me uh, with me once. Um, sometimes. Uh, sometimes the the, uh, the person who is mixing uh, um, he uh, uh, pulls more than uh, um, uh, for example you're pulling, uh, uh, 10 cc 10 cc and you're uh, uh, you're uh, pulling uh, about less than 15 then uh, the, uh, then pushing the gas to, uh, uh, the syringe until it is uh, 10 cc and then pulling air uh, if you do it quickly, the uh, the 15 cc's could be compressed, and then when you when you pull the syringe quickly, the the 15 cc's are still there. Uh, so I recommend that uh, if you uh, push out the five cc's and uh, uh, to be 10, you wait for some time for the for the uh, gas not to be compressed and uh, release the excess uh, gas and then pull on uh, the syringe to uh, mix with uh, air. Um, and the uh, last question is, um, uh, did you, uh, any of the panelists try uh, air as a tamponade with uh, macular holes? Uh, theoretically, uh, air can stay in the eye for five, seven days, and most macular holes close within the first 48 hours to 72 hours. But the tricky thing is that the air becomes this very small over a short period of time. And the main concept of the surgery is to keep contact with the tamponade to the hole. This means that theoretically it can work if the patient stays strictly face down for the, within the first three days, which is usually not possible. And the uh, other thing, air can be uncontrolled uh, sometimes. But from the other side, even before the invention of gas or anything, some people in the early days tried just vitrectomy only for macular hole surgery, and it worked in a decent number, like 60% of cases. And after that, when the introduction of gas, it worked like 75, 80%. And then with the introduction of Ilim Beal uh, as an additional it's step, it's slightly increased. So, Potentially you can, but again, it's a surgery and you're looking for visual prognosis and adding and gas. You can be less conservative, putting like an SF6 gas, which is like staying like a, a, a less than a couple of weeks. And, uh, and um, I see people do that. I myself do C2F6, like an extra precaution, but uh, SF6, there's a very good chance uh, for it to work. And I know, some of my colleagues use routinely. But again, we are trying to achieve the best possible because the macular hole try to achieve the best from the first surgery, if you got what I mean, because any redo, yes. it will be in terms of success and terms of visual expectation where we will be unlikely to achieve the best you can. 
Let me let me answer you, Doctor Doctor Habiba. This is a very important question. Yes. I started doing macular mm -hmm. holes in '94, and at that time there was no peel at all. We used to do vitrectomy, and we used to do uh, a, a pinch. You know, uh, uh, we use uh, a silicone cannula just to make sure that we are removing all the vitreous with the fish mouth technique to make sure that there were no vitreous over the macular area, and we used to inject the eyes and we used to position the patient for one month, face down position. And at that time, our success rate was not more than 65 to 70% closure rate. Regarding the gas, I use the SF6. I will never use SF6 in my, in my macular hold surgery. It's not the, as Dr. Dr. Uh, Abdullah said, if the hole did not did not or does not close in the first 48 to 36 hours, it will not close. It's not the duration of the uh, gas in the eye. It's the surface tension of the gas that's important. So if you if you use the SF6, your chances of closing the hole is less than using C2 F6 or C3 F8. So what I use routinely in, in my every whole case is that C2 uh, F6 gas uh, to give you the Dr. best Ayman, results. Uh, using can I have a SF6 comment? At all. Uh, Ayman, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you Dr. Muhammad the uh, time Actually, to I have uh, I have used uh, SF6 and AIR and uh, they both work, but uh, you're saying uh, you're they will work. The, I'm not the saying percentage I'm of, not saying they yes. will not work, but for Habib. Yes, yes. But uh, the, the, the percentage, percentage of, of success uh, is definitely success. less. You're not sure about this. Okay. Thank you. I tried it. I tried the SF6. Believe me, <laughs> it's better. And we are, uh, if we are going to to uh, uh, direct our junior colleagues, what to do? Uh, definitely, uh, they should do the C2F6 uh, as a routine. So I know that some uh, of our uh, colleagues all over the world are using SF6. Some of them, they tried using air, I know. But I'm talking from my own experience, my humble experience, definitely I think doing uh, using the C2F6 definitely is safer. Uh, one thing just for our junior colleagues. Now, we have different types of gases. You have to go back and look at the different types of gases. We are, uh, uh, diluting the gas to be isobaric so as not to be expansive because all of these gases, the SF6, C2F6, and C3F8 are expansile gases. So we are using it in a different concentration like the C3F8 in 12, 14%, and C2F6 is 16%, and the SF6 in 20% uh, uh, concentrations. But I encourage our junior colleagues to go ahead and read about the gases. This is very important. Uh, any other question to uh, Dr. Abdullah before moving? Uh, if there is no more questions, thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah Aban, for this nice presentation. And let me too oh, move thanks. to my dear thank friend. You. Thank you very Tawfiq. much, Dr. It was a pleasure. Dr. Muhammad Tawfiq will be talking about Parthlana vitrectomy for advanced diabetic retinopathy. By the way, Dr. Muhammad Tawfiq is not only an, an excellent VR surgeon, I know that he's a very good chef too. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, Dr. Raima. Nice. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, uh, please. <laughs> it's a great pleasure uh, and thanks for invitation, Dr. Raima. But I cannot share my screen. Is it any? Uh, yes, now it's good. Dr. Abdullah, yes, if you stop sharing, please. Yes, now I'm sharing the screen. Yes. Is it okay now? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Definitely. Yes. I will speak on Bart's plan of vitrectomy in advanced uh, diabetic uh, retinopathy. I will uh, talk about uh, how can uh, you attack the fibrovascular membrane in fractional retinal detachment. Uh, before I start to play this video, 
I have a, a critical rule when you have a case of traction retinal detachment and you need to start attacking the fibrovascular membrane. Please, first of all, release all the vitreous attachment around the membrane. 360 degree, release the vitreous attachment around the membrane. And after you succeed to release the vitreous attachment, you have a lot of techniques to attacking the fibrovascular membrane. I will first demonstrate how can I attack the membrane unimanually using a 23 gauge cutter, just searching for the bridge. Try to delineate the bridge before you cutting this bridge to segment this membrane. First, search for the bridge and start shaving this bridge to segment the membrane. And if you are segmenting the membrane, it's now easy to delimit or to shaving the fibrous membrane. Believe me, if you are not at the first to release all the vitreous attachment for this membrane, it will be difficult for you to, to segment and also for shaving this membrane. Again, I can see I just first delineating the bridge and go for the fibrovascular membrane in a shaving mode as it's showing in the screen, as a low, low vacuum and high cutting rate, just shaving the fibrovascular membrane. If this is the last piece, if, you, if this fibrovascular membrane attached to a vitreous, believe me, it, you cannot remove it by a vitreous, tracker, uh, vitreous probe and you are not able to shave it at all. Again, this video demonstrates after removing the vitreous attachment, how can I delineate the bridge? You can use the blunt air surface of the cutter to search for the bridge and to segment shaving and segment your membrane. And don't be humble and don't be hurry to peel the membrane. Try to segment the membrane first to have a better uh, accessibility to shaving this membrane. As you can see here, I see a lot of bridges. I segment the membrane and I shave it. And this is what you can see here is, is going very well because I remove all the vitreous attachment around the membrane. This is also the case demonstrate first, how can I reach for the vitreous attachment? I remove it and check it for if the membrane is released or not. Like you can see here, I am checking if the membrane is free from the anterior vitreous attachment or not. Again, I searching for the bridge using the plant shaft of the vitrectum probe, try to segment this membrane. After I feel enough that the bridge is enough and the fibrovascular membrane is a little bit away from the surface of the retina. So I starting segmenting this membrane. For me, don't be hesitated at all if you feel that you are decided to work this case unimanually by the vitrectomy probe and you at a moment you feel that you are not confident to complete it unimanually, please go ahead and switch your hand and working by manually. Because if you have overconfidence that you can work with this membrane unimanually, you will face a lot of uh, problems and situations. As you can see here, in this case, I, did, I feel that I'm not confident to complete the case unimanually, so I switch directly to a bimanual, put my chandelier and go ahead and complete the cases in a bimanual technique. Let me see you, how can I attack the membrane in a bimanual technique using my favorite scissors, which was called blunt curved oval scissor, is designed by Dark Company, and this is for me, it's a beautiful scissor, because while this scissor is closed, it will be a blunt instrument and while it's open it just be sharp from inside and not sharp from outside so if you close the membrane and go inside behind the membrane you can dissect the membrane and if you feel face any epicenter just open the fiber uh, the forceps and go and cut the epicenter and keep it the close all through so just behind the fibrovascular membrane make a dissection of the membrane so if you succeed to separate the membrane by this section more than cutting, you will able to remove the membrane and decrease the risk of uh, creating a breaks and cutting the uh, blood vessel. So it decrease also the bleeding can you have, can, if you can see. You can see I go under the membrane by the forceps closed. And if I found any, any epicenter, I just open the scissor and got, cut the epicenter. Again, go under the fibrovascular membrane with the scissor closed. And if I found any resistance and any epicenter, you just open the scissor and cut it. 
about 60 to 70 percent of your job can be succeed by dissecting not by cutting it's also help you to avoid the bleeding if you can go and cut the bleeder's point and also decrease incidence of break that may happen by the, the scissor and also this scissor at the tip of the scissor is blunt so if you are go blindly under the membrane you are not feared to cut the retina because the tip of the scissor is blunt and this is by the way my favorite scissor where we decided to work by manually this is a beauty so you can go go for epicenters and close the forceps if you need it to dissect it if you have a, a detached retina or something with retinal elevated try to cut it more than dissecting to, because the dissection need like a counteraction and this it it will be done if you're working like this at some time you have a detached retina like a combined Tractional and rheumatoid nodal detachment. In that, in these special cases, I use what's called trimanual technique, not a trimanual technique. I use a BFCO covering the posterior bull, act as a third hand, protecting the retina or preventing the retina to come with you when I tract the fibrovascular membrane and go with the scissor to uh, dissect the membrane. I now put the BFC, act as a third hand, pushing the retina back. And I start working my job by manually, just delineating the retina. As you can see, the retina is detached. And if I go under the fibrovascular membrane, it tends to come with me. But the BFC prevented and like a, a pusher and push the retina back. And believe me, you can do all the job as if you are have no a BFC, but the BFC help you to protect the retina and decrease the incidence of creating a break. And also, act as a hemostatic effect. The PFO decreases the incidence of bleeders that may happen from the bleeders if you cut it. And also, if you cut, make a break, you just cut the fibrous tissue over the break and the break will be flat. Don't fear that the PFO can go under the break. As I'm doing usually, I start do dissecting of the membrane rather than cutting the membrane. I start doing dissecting the membrane rather than cutting the membrane. And if I feel any resistance, I use the scissor and cut it. This is the beauty of the scissor. It's a blunt instrument while it's closed, and it's a sharp instrument while it's open. So I close it and dissect. If I feel I face any epicenter, I open the scissor and cut it. Now we can finish the membrane. I can skip for the sake of time and we can succeed to remove all the membrane by this technique. And also, don't remove the BFC. If you need to uh, do ILM peel in that, such cases, you can inject the brilliant blue or whatever stain you are using inside the bubble and don't remove the bubble. Just aspirate over the surface of the bubble and the, the, the dye will disappear. I will show for you just uh, the, uh, the point of, uh, of a stain. As you can see here, I push the stain inside the bubble and try to remove the ILM also under the PFC. So the PFC, it will cap until you remove all the things. As you can see now, the posterior pool is clear. There is no bleeding or something. If you have a case and you're not able to work it by manually and you don't have chandelier, also if you don't have uh, a scissor you can play with this uh, you can play with this tool it's called illuminated pick this tool is amazing tool if you don't if you are not able to work uh, by manual it's allowing you to work with a light source at the same time with a sharp bend, uh, bended an instrument that can work as a scissor and a blunt an instrument from uh, uh, front to act the sector. It's sharp from beside and didn't sharp from front. So in the tip of the chop of the uh, pick, you can dissect, and from the side you can cut. And you can also succeed to remove as such a big membrane by using this uh, illuminated pick. And I think it's very useful the membrane. But the recording in this shot uh, uh, situation is very difficult because the light is just closer to the membrane and you cannot record it very well. But it succeeded to remove it by uh, illuminated pick and you can see the posterior pool and we can do the job just by illuminated pick. 
So if you have a fibrovascular membrane, you have a golden rule. Please separate the vitreous attachment from the membrane, 360 degree, separate the anterior vitreous from the posterior vitreous, make the fibrovascular membrane, please 360, and start to do your job, whatever you manual or by manual or try manual. Thanks, Dr. Ayman, and sorry for being late. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed, for uh, this beautiful videos and beautiful illustration and talk. Uh, let me just uh, uh, say a few words for our junior colleagues in yeah. diabetic cases. In diabetic cases, whenever definitely uh, the problem is that there is an attachment between the posterior uh, hyaloid and the membranes as Dr. Uh, Tawfiq showed in his beautiful videos. The first thing is you have to cut all the posterior hyaloid attachments from the periphery uh, uh, before attempting to remove the membrane from the posterior uh, over the macula or from the posterior surface so as not to cause peripheral holes or peripheral pores. This is number one. Number two, just to uh, reiterate again what Dr. Muhammad Tawfiq said, about removal of the, um, what we say, uh, what we call tabletop membranes over the macula. Uh, if you uh, remove them quickly or you want to pull to remove, sometimes uh, it looks very easy to go ahead, grasp it and try to pull it. This will cause a lot of bleeding. Don't do this, don't do this. Remove it, dissect it carefully and bit by bit, because if you are going to remove it, it will cause a lot of, of bleeding in this case. Uh, number uh, three is uh, ILM peeling in diabetic cases. Most of the diabetic cases, they don't need ILM peel. But as Dr. Tawfiq shown in his beautiful videos, if you have, uh, 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 if you look at the macula and you see there was a lot of uh, thick membranes over the macula and uh, you're not happy, you can go ahead and peel the ILM just to make sure that you are flattening the macula uh, completely and to prevent the recurrence of the membrane uh, postoperatively. So this is this is a nice trick, but you don't, in most of the cases, I don't peel uh, the ILM in my diabetic case. Uh, sometimes you have to leave some of the membranes if they are like in the superior nasal area and they are not co causing a lot of traction and if they are diff difficult to peel. Don't try to overdo things in difficult cases. Sometimes you might re re leave a little bit of a membrane and it's not causing any problem, especially if it's outside the macula and it will not affect your case. My question to my dear colleague, Dr. Muhammad, is how would you control your bleeding in your cases? Because we know that these cases, they bleed a lot. Do you use Avastin before? Uh, what are the techniques during surgery to avoid I, uh, bleeding? I, I, I may tell you that uh, in the past, I didn't be convinced with the preoperative injections of anti vgf because I was injecting the anti vgf just one day before the surgery. So I stopped yes. using the anti vgf and uh, I really face a lot of intraoperative bleeding that I may deal with it with increasing intraocular pressure, uh, intraoperative diathermy for the bleeders, but when I decided to increase the interval between the injection day and the surgery day up to three days to four days, it's changing my game, totally changing my game. And the bleeding points decreasing totally when I change this point of view of intravitreal injection before traction rate detachment. And also before you can go for the case of traction rate detachment, controlling the hypertension of the patient and ask the doctor, your uh, medical doctors of the patient to control the hypertension. And if you are able to work with such cases with what's called hypotensive general anesthesia, it also helps you to decrease intraoperative bleeding while you do such a cases. So intra, intra, uh, uh, intravitreal injections of anti-VGF, minimal three days preoperative, control the hypertension of the patient. If you are able to work intraoperative general, general anesthesia, hypotensive general anesthesia, it will be perfect. If you face any intraocular bleeding, just to try the increasing of intraocular pressure. If it is not fail, if it's fail, go with the diathermy and diathermy the bleeder's point. This is my way nowadays.
That's 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 great. Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad. I think we don't have. I don't think Dr. Salam is available. Is he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. because he is uh, have a problem. I think he's is is not available. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we have time. I, I have uh, a few slides to show about the history of vitrectomy, but I don't think we have time. Uh, It's almost six o'clock. Let me just uh, uh, finish by thanking our uh, dear colleagues, uh, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Muhammad, for these uh, uh, nice videos Thank and you, for Dr. this Aymer. beautiful presentation. It's always we nice to see you guys, see you. and I hope uh, I hope to see you in in person yeah. uh, one day in Amman, and I hope to meet uh, all of you. Thank you very much. It was uh, you, uh, really a beautiful. Uh, session that uh, thank you so uh, much we enjoyed it uh, i think uh, was really beneficial for our junior colleagues thank you very much thank, thank you, you for thank all you. You. and thanks to for dr muhammad Lamri again thank you thank very you much